What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another NFL season here on Roto Grinders, uh, the PFF show. The faces change, but the content remains the same or gets even better. We've got the helicopter man, Mr. Ian Harditz. Uh, he is formerly from Roto World and uh, I believe over at the Action Network, too. Uh, Ian, you made your way over to PFF. Uh, lots of fun stuff going on over there. Welcome uh, to the Roto Grinders show this year, my man. Great to be here, man. Just so happy to have football back. And, you know, I was a little worried with no preseason. We might see some sloppy ball out of the gate. But, man, Chiefs, Texas, maybe it's just because we have Mahomes and Watson out there. But I'm, you know, cautiously optimistic that we're going to see some fun offensive football all weekend. Yeah, we'll talk about this in the show. We're talking pre-show. I, I think the overs, right? I think maybe there's a little bit more scoring. Offense should be ahead of defense, I feel. We didn't see it. Uh, they were just uh, The Chiefs were just able to run the ball all over the Texans last night. So you didn't get to see Mahomes air it out. Uh, too much but uh, yeah I like the offense quite a bit this week and it'll be very interesting for DFS being a little contrarian I think uh, and week one is always smart but this year uh, I think might be even smarter than it normally is uh, but I want to jump into some cool stuff uh, you brought some of your uh, big articles over to PFF you've got your mismatch manifesto uh, I've got that pulled up here this is basically a summary of all the the O-line versus D-line sack rate pass rush rate all that type of stuff mixed into one in a big article. It's free every week on PFF for everybody. Uh, and you spend so much time on it. I think it's important for you to talk to the people about all of this. Uh, let's get some views over on PFF about this. A great article. I've already read through it a couple of times. So start off explaining what it is. I've got it pulled up on the screen here. And let's talk about this slate. Appreciate it, man. This is my favorite article to do every week, about three years running now that I've been going through it. And it just started with, you know, because I know some people in fantasy like to say defense doesn't matter, but obviously, you know, half of the side of the ball matters. It's just our ability to, you know, kind of incorporate what matters from a defense into our fantasy uh, selection. That's the part I think we kind of mess up. Sometimes we put too much importance on this or that, but I think, you know, with this, it's a good high level way to kind of see the situations where we could have some soft uh, matchups and, you know, just thinking kind of as a whole, when we talk about mismatches in the industry it's always like you know okay we got the number three offense going against the number 24 ranked defense and whatever stat it is but it's always this two-way street so the goal here was to kind of combine these stats make it a one-way metric to kind of denote the top matchups throughout the week so yeah as you said you know we're looking at explosive plays pace pressure uh, yards before contact per rush uh, some epa stuff and uh, yards per drop back just to you know be able to look at these situations around the league where okay just because one game doesn't just because one game pops off you know on pace for example doesn't mean you should buy the running back in that game but if we're seeing a high pace if we're seeing you know plenty of explosive plays a good yards for contact per rush and we know from looking throughout the week that the running back is going to you know be dominating his team snaps those are the types of situations that i think uh, you know can be really useful in dfs and kind of fantasy as a whole i found these to be really nice looking for you know more uh, gpp contrarian plays because it can help point you to situations where it's like okay why are we not on this guy who has this great matchup and all these things going for them and you know maybe you realize that it should be someone that you're on so the first section is a combined explosive uh pass play and run play rate i'm taking the amount of 20 yard pass plays or 15 yard run plays and offense uh has versus what defense allows so like for example you know the houston 15 percent uh explosive pass play rate that means that the houston offense deshaun watson you know as you can see that conditionally formatted red wasn't set up all that well last night compared to uh patrick mahomes you're not sitting deshaun watson you shouldn't have sat deshaun watson because of this chart but you know can help keep your expectations aligned so the one big takeaway i see from this right now is that uh, the los angeles chargers have a 22 percent uh explosive pass play rate and it's only behind the 49ers now obviously going from Philip Rivers to Tyrod Taylor is the big reason for this. This is all 2019 stats. I definitely expect these to improve as the season goes on and we start getting 2020 data, but Either way you look at this, I mean, this was the league's worst defense and explosive pass play rate allowed in Cincinnati. They were also worse in yards per attempt allowed to the slot. So, you know, Britt, we were talking uh, before the show about, you know, maybe some deferring feelings here on Tyrod Taylor. But I really, I really feel like, you know, he's got that dual threat rushing floor and potentially he could even pop up a little bit as a passer this week because of that matchup, because of what Keenan Allen can do out of the slot. So I think, you know, all, if you are like myself, 
I'm looking to roster Tyrod, you know, heavily, particularly in cash games. I would not be afraid to stack him uh, with Keenan Allen by any stretch. Yeah, look, it's Friday, right? You could change my mind. I'm, I'm open, right? Anything can happen. DFS, my views today, uh, they are able to change by the time Sunday morning comes across. So if you've got some good points, <laughs> listen, we can we can hash it out and see what's a good, see what's a good play. Uh, Tyrod, we'll talk about that when we get to a little bit of position stuff. But uh, let's go over a couple other things here. You got uh, Newton, you got some pace stats here. Uh, the one I really noticed for pace, uh, unfortunately, it's not on the main slate, is that Cowboys Rams game. Uh, if you played the Thursday slate, that one looks really good. What do you got for me on the main slate in, in terms of pace? Yeah, Cowboys number two, Rams number three in the situation neutral pace. That game could be a shootout. But yeah, the other one popping off is the Miami Dolphins at the uh, New England Patriots. We see the Patriots just really function as a whirlwind offense uh, more times than not. And, you know, we do also see the Browns, Ravens, Colts, Jaguars having a little more issues uh, with their projected pace. But I think the Patriots matchup, you know, looking at what Cam Newton could potentially be capable of week one. Like, look, the concerns about Jared Stidham or Brian Hoyer, which I was never really all that concerned about them winning that quarterback battle, but those are gone. Cam Newton is the Patriots QB one. He's seemingly as healthy as he's been in a long time. I think we need to start treating this guy as the top 10 fantasy QB he's been throughout his career. And, you know, kudos to Miami for adding Byron Jones, you know, addressing their defense he uh, heavily and often in the early rounds of the draft. But I, you know, it's pretty hard to go from one of the league's worst defenses to even an average unit immediately to start the season. So I'm going to kind of make the Dolphins earn that trust to uh, kind of even consider fading guys against them. I think Cam Newton, this Patriots offense could, you know, really get on the map early week one. Yeah, I like the pace. Uh, Cam Newton, another, these Russian quarterbacks uh, in DFS, you mentioned Tyron Taylor, Cam Newton, they do make sense for cash games. You get the, you know, a couple, three, four fantasy points, rushing floor, you get the passing upside. I'll we'll have to see how Miami, I actually think Miami's going to be a pretty decent team this year. Uh, who, who you got in that division? You got the Bills, you got, you got the Patriots. Who do you think is going to end up winning that? I'm taking the Patriots to win the division. I see it with the Bills. I think the Bills and Steelers just on the side are like, if you just look at every positional group on the team, they are so complete, but it just comes down to Belichick. And, you know, I, I, I do love Josh Allen from an entertainment standpoint, still a little bit worried about how he's going to do when it comes time to uh, knock off the evil empire. So I still got the Patriots. How about you? Um, give me the Bills. I think the Patriots fall off. I and mean, a little too many people okay. opted out on that defensive side okay. for me. Uh, let's go to – I want to jump into uh, the, the trench battle here. Yeah. Uh, yards before contact. Uh, you got some notes on the Arizona run game here. They look to be in a good spot. Kenyon Drake doesn't look like he's going to be that high owned today. Maybe we'll see him a little later on in the show. Yeah, I, I love Drake this week, man. You know, I, I like yards before contact because it just helps. You know, we all, always talk about running backs don't matter. And, you know, if we really think they don't matter, then we should be focusing on what does matter, which is the offensive line versus defensive line. So we, I think combining the yards. Night for sure. Exactly, man. <laughs> uh, combining these yards before contact, I think, can show, you know, with a league average or even a neutral running back what we should expect. But what I think stands out, and this uh, applies to the Chargers as well, where, you know, again, we need to recognize some of the bigger personnel changes here and what that could change with 2020. But you look and the Cardinals are popping, the Ravens are popping. That's because of, I think, the threat that these dual threat quarterbacks like Kyler, like Lamar Jackson put on defense. I mean, PFF, we have team wide yards for contact going back, you know, to however long. Over the last five years, the top four single season offenses were the 2019 Ravens and 2019 Cardinals. That's why you see their rates so high. But the next two teams were the 2015, 2016 Bills. So I know people are really down on Austin Eckler's receiver receiving upside now that Rivers is gone but you know he's going to have a nice boost I think in run game efficiency and that goes for Joshua Kelly and Justin Jackson as well so definitely I'm not afraid to attack that 49er defense because the Cardinals run game is that good and you know I, I also really wouldn't uh understate the potential for these Chargers you know run game and pass game just to blow up in week one all right, let's go to EPA. That's a little bit further down in the article. I know a lot of you guys listen to this on the Roto-Grinders podcast feed. If you ever have a chance to watch it live, it's Fridays at one o'clock uh, live on Roto-Grinders or watch it on YouTube. I do do a lot of screen share stuff. Uh, you'll actually get to see his article. If you don't want to take the time to read it on PFF, again, it is free uh, all season long. Um, if you ever do have a chance to, to watch it live, you are able to get some of the screen share experience on here. So let's talk about uh, EPA. Uh, I, I like this Raiders Panthers game quite a bit to shoot out. You like Josh Jacobs. I like some of the passing options in this game. Explain to me what's going on. Here. 
Yeah, so this is the first time I've uh, actually been able to use EPA. Luckily, some of the uh, goodies they have in the PFF back end got me this data. But uh, so I basically took the offensive EPA and just added it to defensive EPA to try to see, you know, who kind of has the overall general good matchups. And again, this is the first week doing this, so I don't have a big history. But to me, like we should be targeting overs in games that have two offenses with good matchups. And there's only three this week with teams that don't have a negative EPA on either side of the ball. And that was the game last night, Texans Chiefs, which, you know, depending if you got 53 and a half or 54, it did either push or hit the over. And then also Raiders, Panthers, Panthers at zero, zero. But honestly, I mean, if they had Teddy Bridgewater in that offense, mm-hmm. I think we would definitely see a positive note. And then uh, Seahawks and Falcons, I think is the other one that's almost going under the radar. I think the Seahawks Falcons could be the game that everyone wants the saints and Buccaneers to be. I mean, just those quarterbacks. And I think the defenses are quite a bit worse for Seattle and Atlanta. Seattle secondary is a force to be reckoned with now, but their front seven is still an issue. So you might look at that Tampa Bay saints game. I think it's going to be super chalky and, you know, they have some ballers all over the place on both defenses. So I think uh, that could be a little more of a defensive battle than people are giving it credit for. And I'd be willing to pivot uh, mostly in tournaments to uh, the Seattle and Atlanta game. Yeah, you're out there. You're grinding all the PFS stuff 24-7. I'm plugged into the DFS world. That Seattle-Atlanta game, uh, that is basically the game of the week, in my opinion. That's where everyone's going to be going. You got Julio, DK Metcalf. I uh, got both quarterbacks. You, you know, we can mix in some running backs in that game, too. Uh, lots to like in that game. The DFS world is plugged into that. Uh, so I gave you a couple of reasons to go check out Ian's article over on PFF. Uh, let me give you a million, actually 100 million reasons why you should listen up. DraftKings, the leader in one day fantasy sports, is celebrating the return of sports by giving away up to $100 million in prizes to all of their customers, including one lucky winner who will take home $1 million. To claim your share of up to $100 million in instant giveaways, all you have to do is download the app and sign up using promo code DFF, that's D as in Dave, DFF and then enter DraftKings free football survivor pool. Yes, it really is that easy to claim your share of up to 100 million in instant giveaways and put yourself in the running to win a $1 million cash prize. The top prize is reserved for one lucky winner, but everyone who signs up and enters DraftKings free football survivor pool will receive an instant bonus prize of at least five bucks. I got five bucks in my account. That's already in play. You can get it too. And while you're in the app, don't forget to check out all of the great daily fantasy contests DraftKings is hosting for basketball and baseball. So download the DraftKings app now and use promo code DFF to claim your share of $100 million in instant giveaways and put yourself in the running for the $1 million cash top prize. That's promo code DFF to get your share of $100 million in prizes only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Uh, real quick, Survivor? Colts, right? You're not going to get many more times to use them this year. That, that's my pick for Survivor week one. What do you got, Ian? Yeah, I'm with you. I will say, though, man, we got to peep this. I was looking at some injuries last night, and low-key, Quentin Nelson, DMP with a back, mm-hmm. and R- Ryan Kelly and their left tackle, Anthony Costanzo. They've been limited. So, I, I don't know. I haven't heard that those guys are going to necessarily miss the game or anything. I, I would still, even without those guys, I think the Colts can take care of business. The Jaguars might be that bad. But, you know, before you go and do anything too crazy, Crazy with your potential ownership with Mac and Jonathan Taylor. I would want to make sure that those uh, offensive linemen are going to be there. And I do want to note too, we are giving discounts to the first month uh, through the, through our R at Roto Grinders core four subscriptions. If you were looking, it's normally $39.99 a month uh, at rotogrinders.com slash media slash PFF. Devin will drop the link and chat for you guys. You can get yourself a discount. It looks like it's $5 off your first month. Uh, and then if you want the core four plus the specialist, that's normally a hundred a month. You like playing tennis and college football and all the little niche sports. Uh, we're offering a twenty dollars discount combined with the core four on that for seventy nine ninety nine. So click that link in the chat. And if you were just looking for it, it's rotogrinders.com slash media slash PFF. Uh, we'll get you some discounts here at Rotogrinders if you are new uh, to our subscriptions. Uh, all right, let's talk a couple of bets. Right, betting market it's exploding everywhere. Uh, I'll let you go first. Give me a couple of your favorite bets. Uh, I'll even maybe I'll pull up green line on PFF. See if we can see what, see what that's talking. Yeah. Ho- hopefully they're not contradicting myself, but uh, right now I got the saints bucks under 49 and a half mentioned this before, but we just got two really good defenses on both sides of the ball. I mean, Tampa finished last season as the sixth best defense in DVOA. And I kind of remembered that, that they were better than I think most people gave them credit for, but looking more at the saints, I mean, they were eighth last year in DVOA and, you know, we kind of saw them limp a little bit uh, towards the end, towards the 
finish line last year. But I think a big part of that was Marcus Davenport getting injured down the stretch. I mean, with him, Cam Jordan, you know, uh, some of their linebackers they have, it's a strong unit. And they've had Marshawn Lattimore there to kind of hold up the secondary, but it's kind of just been the one man show. He's been a little bit inconsistent to start his career. I do think he could take a leap forward. And now he finally has some help. I mean, bringing Malcolm Jenkins back there, he's been a linchpin in every secondary he's been in. Janoris Jenkins on the other side is, you know, okay, we saw Mike Evans and some of these guys did do him last year. I get it. But when you're asking him to be your number two corner, potentially motivated version of the artist formerly known as Jackrabbit, I do think the Saints defense could be really good. And hey, you know, I just think Tom Brady and these guys throughout the fantasy process, you know, they've kind of been uh, priced towards their ceiling. I think we're seeing that in the betting market now in week one. I'm comfortable taking uh, this under. It's a, it's a shootout because it's Brady and Breeze, but come on, these are two 40 plus year old quarterbacks. At some point, I think we're going to see, you know, things slow down a tad. I'm not anticipating the same kind of pass happy offense in Tampa Bay that they were utilizing with Jameis. I think we see things a little more under control with TB12 back there. And then a uh, second bet. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Real quick. Uh, so like every, everyone figured this out already, Ian, right? This, this game opened at 50 and a half. I think a, a day or two ago when we were talking about this, it was 49. It's down to 47 and a half right now. You still think we can hit the under? <laughs> Well, geez, now it's working against <laughs> me a little all, bit. Uh, Warren Sharp must have put this out. <laughs> sheesh. Well, 47 and a half is a little more reasonable. I wouldn't call that uh, as much of a best bet. But, hey, you know, if you can still get that 49 and a half or even 50 mm-hmm. line, definitely don't be afraid to uh, smash that under. <laughs> all right. Let, let me give you uh, my, my favorite one of the week. It's going to be the Lions-Bears. Uh, and this is a fo- this was 43. It's going the opposite way for me. The market's now at 42. I was literally, this is a true story. I was on my way to bet this yesterday when the Gall- Kenny Galladay injury news sort of popped up, just did a U-turn and came back <laughs> home because uh, I need Kenny, Kenny Galladay in this game. They expressed a little bit of optimism uh, just a couple hours before the show here. This is at 42. I like this. Mitch Trubisky, everything, he's, he's got to perform. Uh, I like both offenses in this game. I think both defenses uh, aren't, aren't very good. Uh, this is at 42. Uh, Trubisky, he's going to be one of my favorite plays in, in things like the Millionaire Maker. Uh, I like the targets. Allen Robinson, give me Anthony Miller. If Galladay suits up, he's great. Marvin Jones, TJ Hawkinson. Uh, I guess Adrian Peterson's going to get a lot of work. That's not making the over <laughs> look pretty good to me. But yeah, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of offense this week. I think in the limited practices, uh, no preseason. I think offense should have an advantage over defense. Uh, I'm going to be, t- I think if you blindly take overs, you're probably going to end up on the right side of it this week, but this one is definitely one of my favorite. Uh, I'll let you give one more. Uh, you got the the game of the week. You got the Seahawks uh, Falcons. Who do you like there? Yeah, I think the Seahawks, I mean, minus one and a half. I have no problem t- uh, I, taking those points. Don't even worry about the money line. I think this is going to not even be all that close, to be honest. I don't know why these two teams are kind of even being priced as similar talents. I mean, I know the Falcons are at home, so we can say Seahawks are a road dog. They are getting the respect. But, I mean, on offense, okay, we have two middling offensive lines. Maybe you even give the nod to Seahawks. I think we can all agree 2019 Russell Wilson was better than 2019 Matt Ryan. And then, like, you know, okay, at wide receiver, running back, I don't think anything's throwing that in the Falcons direction. So we have a better offense in Seattle and the defense. I don't even think it's close, man. I mean, look, Seattle wasn't able to add another piece to truly re- re- replace uh, Jadavian Clowney. And he, as much as people like to point to his lack of sack numbers, still a guy that, you know, offensive coordinators are game planning against every week, trying to double him up, not let him take over a game. So that's concerning. But at the same time, adding Quentin Dunbar as their cornerback too, adding Jamal Adams to kind of sew things up in the middle. This is the best secondary. I think the Seahawks have had since their Legion of boom days. And, you know, on the Falcon side of the ball, I just don't see anything uh, that should make us think this could be even an average defense. I mean, good on them for adding Dante Fowler. I know they started to come on a little bit towards the end of the season, but you know, when I looked at all lines to start the week, this was the one that really popped out because I, I think the Seahawks should be at least field goal favorites in this spot. All right. Uh, the other one I like, I won't get too much into it for sake of time, but Bill's Jets over uh, it was like 40, 41. It opened. It's down to 39 and a half. I think it's too big of an overreaction. I like offense this week. I like Jamison Crowder. Uh, I like J- the Bills might put up 39 and a half on their own this week here. So I think <laughs> I just need like 10, 13 points out of the Jets. Uh, give me that one as well here. Uh, all right. Uh, we like to talk DFS here at Roto Grinders. Let's get into some position talk for this show here. What we're going to do uh, every week, we're going to have uh, each of us bring a cash play. Each of us is going to bring a tournament play and uh, note for you, Ian's got his helicopter article up at pro football focus, uh, but he's going to give those away here at the end. Everyone who's sort of in the running for the finalist, that's going to drop at the end of every show every week, but let's jump into this at the quarterback position. Uh, you got Tyrod Taylor. He's someone you like for your cash games. We'll get those out of the way first. 
You mentioned it at the top of the show, you know, the, the Cincinnati defense, not looking too great. Um, you, you really think, you know, it, does, does Mike Williams, if he doesn't suit up, does that really do anything to, to hurt Tyrod? Or you like the rushing floor? You like Keenan Allen out of the slot. You got Hunter Henry over the middle. Uh, I, my worry, this is my worry, right? Is that they're, they're just going to play real slow this year because they know their defense is so good that they need to use that and take time off the clock. I don't know if there's going to be a need for Tyrod to really throw the ball a ton in this game. I don't think you're wrong, but honestly, I'm fine with that, particularly in cash games where we're just, you know, kind of looking to meet that salary implied total, not necessarily, you know, crush it by five times. I think Tyrod has a good chance to do that out of anyone on the slate, man. I mean, you go, I know we're going back five years with his, uh, with his stats and stuff, but we're talking about the QB seven back-to-back seasons, 2015, 2016 in fantasy points per game, just a dual threat. It's just such a cheat code in fantasy sports. And to get that sort of discount at the QB position, I do think it opens things up elsewhere. I don't even care if Mike Williams uh, is inactive man I don't think the Bengals defense really deserves all that much credit I know they you know went ahead and tried to take as many corners as they could from the Vikings and it seems like to try to patchwork the group but I think you know having Keenan still having Henry having Eckler the situation where Tyrod I think is going to be just fine purely on the rushing and they'll have at least some if not you know surprising amount of passing production so matchups great he's you know the whole offseason they've been talking about him being more than a bridge quarterback he was the backup last year it's not like he doesn't know the system already I think we need to accept that for at least these first eight, nine weeks of the season, Tyrod Taylor is going to be flirting with QB1 production, I think, more weeks than not. All right. Uh, mine is, and this is sort of on the presumption that some of this injury stuff holds true. And we get a little bit of value. Maybe we can play a Miles Sanders. He's been practicing a couple days in a row, right? He's a nice value. Uh, but I got money to spend, and I'm looking to spend it on Lamar Jackson. How, how do you not want a quarterback and a running back? <laughs> one in your lineup in one singular spot. So this dude looked pretty good to me. I think there's really no problem for him going up against the Browns. And I think there's just enough value. I guess we can talk a little bit about like Antonio Gibson and let's pretend David Montgomery's out and we get to use Tariq Cohen, right? There's just enough value there. I think some of the top receivers on DraftKings specifically are a little underpriced, right? You got that five to $6,500 range full of really good plays. Uh, I, I can make it work with Lamar and anytime I can get Lamar, you're not really going to be able to get him too often, especially if he has a good week one, uh, I think you got to go for it. So I'm really liking him in cash games today, the running quarterbacks, right? Another guy you want to talk about for tournaments, Cam Newton. These are, you know, uh, who is it? Reeves, the Konami code. He's always said that. Yep. I mean, these guys are fantasy gold. Yeah, and that's all Cam's been when he's been out there. And to see him priced outside the top 10 QBs when he's been nothing except the top 10 QB uh, throughout his career in fantasy, it's just, you know, wild to see. And, yeah, I'm not concerned about the Miami matchup. Like, okay, maybe things won't be as easy downfield as, you know, they could be against another squad. But even then, it's a Josh McDaniels offense that's consistently been able to scheme guys open, you know, except kind of down the stretch of last season when, okay, was that the wide receivers or was that because every single person out there was so banged up? So I do think, you know, there's some truth to what Edelman and some of these guys have been saying that defenses aren't going to be able to defend them the same way now that Cam is under center and he brings, you know, that much bigger threat to scramble and move around. So it's going to be a new look Patriots offense. And I think it's a situation where it would hardly be shocking if the Patriots just steamroll the Dolphins, have plenty to play play for considering what happened them uh, last season week 17 in that matchup and you know it's people wondering if cam's gonna run like okay maybe he's not gonna have the 10 12 rush attempts we would see in like a 2014 2015 season but the patriots wouldn't have brought him here and just plan on not using his single best skill set and one of the single best rushing quarterbacks we've ever seen is cam newton so i think you know it's he's 6100 this week but a, a big week or two early on i don't think we're gonna see him under 65 the rest of the season so get on cam now all right. So my guy for tournaments, I already mentioned this, uh, Mitchell Trubisky, his ownership, uh, I think he's coming in at like two or 3% owned. Uh, I've heard a lot of talk about him so far this week and I'm on board. I love him personally. He's got everything to prove in this game. He's going to be in a dome week one, right? That you, you always like quarterbacks in a dome, even though it's early in the season. That's plus for me. I like his targets, right? Especially if David Montgomery's out, they ain't going to run the ball 25 times. They're going to be passing the ball. You got three Cohen out of the backfield. Maybe some some Cord Cord Corderell Patterson. I, I heard you might hey, like that. Hey, there we go. I heard you might <laughs> like him. Uh, uh, you got Allen Robinson, Anthony Miller diced up the Lions last year uh, until the final two games of last season, right? He was hurt at the be you know for a little while at the beginning of the season. Uh, the final two games of the season, the buzzsaw, Kansas City at Minnesota, right? The four games prior to that, 21, 33, 27, 21 DraftKings points. That's looking pretty juicy with a condensed target tree for the millionaire maker. Uh, I love myself, Mitch Trubisky. 
you could you i don't know i almost want to play him in cash games if i'm not playing lamar i think he's oh gonna, my goodness I think, I think he's gonna have a good game i like him quite a bit don't know if i'd pull the trigger in cash though but for tournaments love him great game stack imagine if galladay's out marvin jones hawkinson amandola right those some of those guys are cheap you can just really put all these guys in a great lineup have plenty of money to spend elsewhere uh one of my favorite plays of the week yeah, I, was, I mean, I'd be with you a little more on cash. The mid-game benching risk wasn't there. But, yes. look, Trubisky provided some serious spike weeks in 2018. He Good stopped run. he stopped running for, like, the first eight, nine weeks of last year, and he had that Cowboys game on Thursday night where all of a sudden they were again. So I would assume in the kind of, like, the last-ditch effort to make Trubisky work, they're going to really dial into that part of his game a little bit more because, like, how could you not? So, yeah, GPPs, I'd definitely come more around Trubisky as the week's gone on. All right, running back, let's move to that. Uh, here, here's my take on the running back position, right? We've got some sexy names in, in Antonio Gibson. We've got a Tariq on if David Montgomery is possibly out. I don't, I don't think there's a must play at running back. Usually we have those. Christian McCaffrey, his price is sky high. I think you can fit him in on FanDuel reasonably good. A little bit tougher of a sell on DraftKings this week. I think you can mix it up a little bit. You've got Josh Jacobs as a play. Uh, again, I'll, hey, if I don't like your play, I'm going to talk to you about it here. I'm always <laughs> worried if, like, why do we like him? Because the game script should be good. If the game script doesn't go his way, he's a, he's one of those guys where it can fall apart fast, especially on the PPR site like DraftKings. But, I mean, they got rid of uh, Bowden. They got rid of uh, – who, who else did they ship uh, off? The, 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 the Reddick's on the practice squad or cut or something. Yeah, they, they, they got a couple of guys. Maybe he catches a couple of passes. But the, uh, the trench battle, everything lines up for him to just have a, have a big game on the ground. Look, I think sometimes we overrate run defenses and because a lot of really good teams like the Bills and the Patriots and even the Ravens and even 49ers to an extent, like it's it's 2020. You want your secondary to be much better than your front seven, defend the run. You want to prioritize that. So sometimes we see teams that are, you know, number one in pass defense, number 12 in run defense, number one or two overall. Like that's not necessarily a defense we should target on the ground. I think the two exceptions to this rule are the Carolina Panthers and the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, last year, just they could not slow down anyone. And I think you look at both defenses and neither has made any sort of, you know, adjustments to kind of improve. If anything, the Panthers have gotten worse, you know, losing Keekly and uh, some of the guys they did at the line of scrimmage. So I do think this is the matchup where you can kind of wave Jacob's target concern away because first of all, he's not like him and Derrick Henry, they're like, they're game script dependent, but they're getting 15 plus carries pretty much no matter what. So I do think we can, you know, fire up 15 plus touches and I'd be kind of shocked if it's not closer to 25 and, you know, looking at these games throughout, the week i've been kind of looking at a which could be kind of the ravens dolphins just blow out from last season that we didn't quite see coming that we should have and colts jaguars as we mentioned survivor that's the one that sticks out but i do wonder if we're kind of underrating the chances for the raiders to really start this season uh strong panthers they got some talent on offense but no one has more continuity concerns to overcome in this weird season i'm kind of betting against the panthers maybe becoming fun as the year goes on but in september i have no problem firing up guys against them ian look i gotta compete with you on these helicopter plays stop stealing my thunder <laughs> towards the end of the show here right I, I do like the Raiders I like that game quite a bit um a cash game I mentioned right you've got Gibson I don't know I think he's a little risky I might still play him if I need you know 4k if, if he was 3k minimum I think he would for sure yeah. be in the 4k minimum makes it a little bit dicier on DraftKings I don't know if I'd play him on FanDuel um you got Tariq Cohen uh, I, I like pass catching backs on DraftKings uh so I'm looking at Elvin Kamara he's 7200 you know CMC's 10,000. And you can make that work, especially if you play Tyrod, if you play a cheap tight end, if you go for uh, one of the cheap wide receivers, you know, maybe a couple of those, you can get CMC, but he's a little tough of an ask on DraftKings. Uh, so I'm going Kamara, saving almost $3,000. I know that defense, uh, you know, you like the under in this game. I'm still okay with that. Uh, I've got I've got a projected for 81 receptions this year. Does that, does that sound reasonable? <laughs> you better, <laughs> man. How can you project him for anything else? So, and you mix those targets in, I think this contract stuff isn't really going to be any detriment, um, you know, to, to any sort of workload week one, the little back injection he was getting, that doesn't seem to be that big of a deal in my opinion either. I'm looking for, I don't know, 12 to 17 rushing attempts with six to 10 targets. You, you put all that together, you mix in a touchdown. That sounds pretty good. I always, not 
the one thing about the pass catching backs like Kamara, the hundred yard bonus, he's like 95 rushing or 92 receiving. And he just never gets there on the bonus sometimes, <laughs> which is a little annoying, but give me a little bit of PPR upside. And if you want to save $2,800, I think that's pretty meaningful on DraftKings this week. He's someone I'm really looking at, um, at, at least in cash games. Don't know if I'm going to land on him yet. Um, and you got the couple of cheap guys if the injury situations play out. Uh, you mentioned for tournaments that in, in the opening of the show, the O-line, D-line battle uh, between Arizona and San Francisco. So uh, Kenyon Drake in a GPP, let's talk about it. Yeah, man. You know, we saw last time the 49ers were on the field, Damian Williams going for 100 plus and uh, two touchdowns. And OK, I, I do think the 49ers are a great defense, but we saw teams give them trouble when they were able to get the run game outside. And the Cardinals were kind of the first team to do that last season. They scored 25 and 26 points in those two matchups and kind of set the stage for some of those, you know, RPO friendly schemes that really did give the 49ers uh, some trouble as the season went on. I was higher on Drake at the beginning of the week because, you know, we know Buckner's an Indy, but Nick Bosa had that muscle strain that was kind of we didn't know what was going on but he's been off the injury report he's okay Fred Warner was on the COVID list but he's apparently back feeling okay so it's going to be as close to a full strength uh, 49ers defense as possible so I wouldn't be willing to roll with Drake in cash but GPP man again this is a matchup that the Cardinals are capable of winning we're looking at the single most efficient rushing offense from last season in yards for contact per rush I just think that you know it's a one back backfield and Drake right now is not being priced as a single back I mean whether it was David Johnson Chase Edmonds or Kenyon Drake last year they were getting the lion's share of snaps targets and rush attempts alike Drake's the guy the injury is not a concern and I mean I you know, I, I say not cash, but honestly, I'm I'm more confident in Drake's floor against the 49ers than I am Miles Sanders against Washington. Okay, 6,400 projected at 6% ownership. Uh, sounds like someone that can win you a, a, a GPP. And one guy I like, and, uh, you know, everyone's talking about the pass game in the Atlanta-Seattle, right? And I get it, right? You got Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, DK Metcalf. How do you not want to rouse these guys? Uh, Tiger Lee knows how to score touchdowns. And I, I would imagine the Falcons – probably try to get him a couple of touchdowns The reports out of camp. A couple just came out today. He's looking good. The coach likes him. 15 to 25 touches, a wide band. If he hits the upper end of it, uh, I know you like Seattle, but the Falcons are at home. If they get out to a lead, I'm expecting to see some Todd Gurley. This gives you leverage uh, off uh, of a high scoring game. Maybe somehow one of these teams falter, or maybe it's Gurley that finds the end zone once or twice. Uh, I, I think he's a pretty good leverage player with everybody focusing on the passing game. So Gurley in a tournament, uh, I think his price on DK, where is where is he sitting here? So he is coming in. 61, under, right? Yeah, under Kenyon Drake, who's 64. Todd Gurley at 10% ownership, coming in at 6,100. That sounds good to me, and you get the leverage off the pass game. This is the spot to play him in. I mean, I, I'm a little concerned if he's going to be the outright fully featured guy. I mean, I think some combination of Ito, Brian Hill, and Allison could combine for like 10 touches ish. But like you said, man, he's going to, he's the guy to get touchdowns. And this is again, one of the highest potential scoring games of the week. So if you're going to be in on Todd Gurley, it might as well be this week while he's at a, you know, depressed price tag and ownership as well. Yeah. You got to figure Todd Gurley health, probably the healthiest he's going to be all season too here yep. against Seattle. Yep. Uh, all right, let's move to wide receiver. Always a lot of plays at wide receiver. Let's try to narrow it down a little bit. Uh, the cash plays, there's a couple, right? Everyone, I'm going to talk about Devontae Adams in a second. Deshaun Jackson, you have listed here. I guess I'll see if you still like him. With It looks like Rieger is probably going to end up playing in this game. See how that affects him. Uh, you got guys like McLaurin. He's out there. Uh, you know, that, that mid-tier of wide receiver looks pretty good. So let's talk about the Eagles, Deshaun Jackson, just underpriced on both sites. This was when we thought Rieger was probably going to be out. How do you feel about him with Rieger looking like he's going to end up suiting up? I'm not even worried about the Rieger thing, man. We have no idea if Rieger is going to be out there playing limited snaps or what. We've never, we've never seen the guy. And I mean, there's a perfectly realistic chance that Rieger comes in and just is the number two behind Djax. Even if he's not, it's still an offense that doesn't have Jeffrey, doesn't have really any wide receivers beyond Djax and uh, Rieger that I think are going to command any sort of you know consistent target share. They got the tight ends and Miles Sanders who will be involved as well. But honestly, like I don't mind having Rieger there because I think if anything, it's going to lower the ownership and uh, make Djax that much more. Uh, appealing uh, in GPPs, he'll still be pretty chalky, I think. And that's why in cash games, I'm fine to kind of, you know, take that little discount, except that a lot of people are also going to be rostering him, you know, try to win elsewhere. But it's a dream matchup that we, you know, saw what he did in week one last year. We got the revenge game storyline going in. I just think anytime we got a healthy DJX out there and, you know, in a position to get eight plus targets, uh, we got to go with it. It's again, not a, not a hard matchup at all. The 
Washington defense is going to be a good case study this year because their D-line is suddenly full of monsters with all these high-round draft picks they've gotten over the years, you know, adding Chase Young most recently. But their cornerbacks are in a really rough spot. I mean, letting they, they traded Quentin Dunbar to uh, Seattle. He was PFS number three overall corner last season. And, you know, just not replacing him really with anyone. I think d can eat against any of these corners that are out there. All right. I'm looking at Devontae Adams, 7,300 on DraftKings. He should basically be – priced a little bit closer to Michael Thomas, I feel, who's 9,000. I think the price on Michael Thomas is fine, but Adams, right? Over 100 yards in both games against Minnesota last year. They didn't draft anybody uh, to close out the season when everyone was hurt. 25, 39, 22, 26. Uh, these are these are DraftKings fantasy point totals, right? Just monster performances. Hard to see him fail, and uh, I, I don't know. I think I would pretty much project him to have a good game every game of the season, unless there's some, some form of an injury right now. Uh, and at 7,300, you're getting a nice price discount does look to be one of the higher projected on wide receivers. So in tournaments, you always got to weigh, Hey, <clears throat> do you want to play the highest, you know, projected on receiver? That's always a question I have. I'm usually underweight, but Hey, I mix that up in cash games. And, and I think I'm going to be playing Devonte Adams this week. Well, I'm feeling stuff on digs and GPPs, man, because like, why is this guy not getting more hype across the injuries this week? You're playing the Jets, who were already not a defense to fear. And that was with Jamal Adams, with C.J. Mosley, at least, you know, appearing to be there. Mosley opted out. Adams is now in Seattle. And you look at these cornerbacks the Jets have. No one can guard Stephon Diggs. And I don't think really anyone across the league can hold up all that consistently against Diggs. We're talking about a true top 10 talent at the wide receiver position. And, you know, in my wide receiver cornerbacks uh, matchup column that you have up right now, we see the Josh Allen issues throwing the deep ball he does the lot he doesn't do it very well but you know when you bring in the league's reigning number one receiver in yards gained on passes done at least 20 yards downfield it makes sense that that helps Allen's ability when he's trying to do just that so it is a prime matchup it's not like uh Josh Allen has you know been unable to enable um really solid fantasy wide receivers John Brown's a PPR wide receiver 20 last season we sp- we saw plenty of spike weeks from Robert Foster and even Zay freaking Jones uh over the last two seasons so you know I know that Josh Allen 300 yard uh, drought and all that but I just think Diggs is a top 10 receiver and people are really not paying enough attention to him in an absolute smash spot keep an eye on the wind I was looking a little little earlier in the week and I saw you know getting that 15 20 mile per hour range so if we see that uh, skirt up a little more maybe I'll start to get off this a little bit but for now man I plan on having a ton of digs come Sunday and go check out the weather report. Kevin Roth here on Rotor Grinders NFL tab weather. He'll give you up to date and he'll update that usually, I don't know, about an hour before lock on Sunday as well to give you the, 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 all the weather note news that you need there. A couple tournament plays for me. I like uh, Terry McLaurin. He's going to be popular, uh, but I do like him. Pure alpha uh, second year player. Uh, and you don't beat the Eagles by running the ball. You beat them by throwing the ball. So McLaurin looks pretty good. Uh, I got DJ shark. Uh, he's looking pretty juicy to me. They're going to have to pass the ball. He's another one of these uh, true alpha receivers on his team. You got to see what's this LaVisca Chenault news. Hey, he's going to be used in all these strange ways. I'll believe it when I see it. I think they're going to be funneling targets to Shark as they get down. Uh, I already mentioned Survivor Contest. I like the Colts to win. Uh, bring that back on the opposite side with Shark and tournaments. And if you want to whisper uh, Jamison Crowder in a GPP, <laughs> you can convince me on that. You like Herndon. We'll talk about him in a second. Uh, Crowder, 27 targets against the Bills last year. Why? Well, it's because they got some really good outside corners and they got nobody else to throw the ball to in the middle of the field. That's going to be Crowder. Uh, after Diggs catches two deep balls, look for Crowder to get peppered <laughs> in the middle. And uh, I like Crowder. Uh, if you're playing Allen and Diggs, uh, he looks like to bring back from that game. You're going to like Herndon. Herndon. Um, but uh, Jamison Crowder looks pretty juicy to me. Currently projected sub 5% owned on DraftKings. Uh, all right, let's move to tight end. Uh, we'll throw a couple of these out. I mentioned Herndon. Uh, it's just got to be, right? The who, uh, Mims, he's basically out. Uh, it's Crowder. Uh, they've got a couple nobodies else on the outside, and they're basically going to be taken out of the game by the, the Bills outside cornerbacks. Uh, they're just going to be funneling targets into the middle of the field, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, the only real cash game viable tight ends under that 4K mark, I think you got Jack Doyle at 3,600 with Trey Burton out, but I wonder how much the Colts are even going to have to pass the ball in that game. Will Disley at 3,400, who knows what that rotation is going to be with Greg Olson there now. He, he's already hurt too, so he's like uh, that came on right oh before gosh. the show. I don't think he's going to uh, 
already. That sucks, man. All right, Ian Thomas, 3,400. He's apparently going to play, but he's dealing with an injury, limited snaps. Wouldn't it be a surprise there? Like Tyler Eifert, 3,300. We don't know if he's going to be splitting snaps. It, Irv Smith, 3,100. He's going to be splitting snaps. Rudolph, I just think Herndon's the clear pick under 4K at 3,300. Even without these injuries, I mean, I think we could probably project him to be the Jets' number two option in the pass game, and it really wouldn't be all that shocking if he overtakes Crowder. Um, I, I wouldn't be expecting a ton. I think one of Crowder or Herndon is probably going to be uh, the guy, you know, maybe flirt with 10 plus targets this week. But, you know, every single bit of news we've seen from Herndon has been fantastic throughout this offseason, throughout training camp. We've already had Gase anoint him as a starter. I think he is going to tear it up, you know, at least as much as anyone on the Jets uh, in that offense can quote unquote tear it up. All right. Uh, I'm looking at in cash. I got Hayden Hurst. He's the, you know, everyone's going to be focused on, on the outside. Uh, but I think Hurst pretty much, I mean, Austin Hooper is not a great athlete. He's not like a great receiver. He just sort of catches the ball because Matt Ryan and that offense throw the ball a lot. I think Hurst at, what is he, 4,300 on DraftKings, 53 or something on DraftKings or on FanDuel. Uh, I think he looks pretty good if you're not spending up. Uh, I, I like him quite a bit. And I also want to know too, uh, you're looking cheap. How, how about uh, Lance? Can Lance make you dance at 2,800? <laughs> My goodness. You want to go down to Lance? Lance Tom. Listen, times are tough on DraftKings. You, you think that's a good cheap oh player? Uh, I don't know about Logan Thomas, man. That's tough. I it's it's is he even gonna be the number one guy? I feel like Sprinkle could be splitting the snaps there. No, I'm not staying away from that. I, I need to see some signs and evidence that Logan Thomas is in fact the number one guy there before I'm uh, dumpster diving that far. All right. I'll let you talk about a spend up for tournaments. I got another one. If you want to spend all the way up on Kittle, uh, tight ends versus Arizona. That's been a thing for, I think, as long as we've been playing DFS. Uh, they did draft Simmons, right? Maybe that changes a little bit. But the condensed target tree, right? If both uh, uh, both the receivers are out for San Francisco, uh, I think Kittle. But someone I'm looking at, I mentioned I like the Raiders. Uh, how about Darren Waller? I'm a little concerned the volume might not be there. But let's just pret- let's pretend Josh Jacobs isn't the one that gets into the end zone. Darren Waller looks like a pretty good Renzo target to me in that game. Uh, and I think they're going to be able to move the ball pretty easily against Carolina. Why not Darren Waller in a tournament? He's reasonably priced, had big production at the start of last year before falling off just a, a little bit. And he's sandwiched in between, you know, Kittle, Mark Andrews, and Zach Ertz. So when you're looking for an ownership play in these large field tournaments of someone who's shown he can post giant spike weeks, why not Darren Waller at 5,900 on DraftKings? So he's someone I'm giving some credence to in tournaments. Uh, you want to talk about Mark Andrews, and I, I agree completely on Mark Andrews. Yeah, I think Waller's a, a good pivot, though, especially, you know, in that price range. Should he be the number three price guy with, you know, a Witten likely taking a portion of the snaps and having Rugs and Edwards to compete with now? Maybe not, but yeah, he's obviously still capable of putting up a big week, so get that depressed ownership if you can. Andrews, look, he's the Ravens' number one receiver, I and mean, he spent last season about 66% of his snaps in the slot or out wide. You know, he's labeled a tight end, but, you know, they're going to chuck him the ball, and now not having Hayden Hurst in there, it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, Andrews even flirts with eight to ten targets per game instead of that kind of six or seven mark he was at last year i know we spent a lot of the offseason you know talking about how lamar jackson's uh passing touchdown rate is going to regress and yeah it probably will it's hard to be that freaking good two years in a row but i think sometimes what we forget in the regression talk is the reality that oftentimes it goes with an increase in volume because great players play great and in the following season the coaches want to give them more opportunities so i think with andrews you know sitting at that 98 uh target mark from last year like yeah okay maybe he's not going to have quite the same touchdown rate because lamar won't either but wouldn't be shocking if Andrews is able to get into that 115 120 target mark you know perfectly winnable matchup week one against Cleveland if you are going to uh, roster Lamar you know I, I, Hollywood's looking pretty uh, chalky this week so you know maybe you can go him and Andrews but just going Lamar and Andrews might be the move either way Cleveland secondary uh, obliterated right now by injuries too so there's a, there's a lot to like for that uh, Baltimore passing game uh, all right, I'm going to skip the defense talk. Uh, I just don't think uh, in the interest of time, we'll talk about that. But before we bring in the chopper blades, right? And we'll talk about some helicopter plays. We'll talk about something similar. And that is Manscaped. Support for this podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. And they obsess over their technology developments to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. That's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. The Manscaped engineering team spent 18 months perfecting the greatest ball hair trimmer ever created and just released the new and improved Lawn Mower 3.0. The third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents 
thanks to advanced skin safe, skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. When I tell you this is premium, I mean premium. This might even be better than RG premium. I don't know. The battery will last up to 90 minutes so you can take a longer shave. The waterproof technology lets you groom in the shower. It's got a light. It illuminates everything so you're not nicking yourself up. 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. And if you want to show off your stand, show your mower off loud and proud because this intelligently designed stand is a convenient charging dock powered by USB. If you are listening to me speak right now, I want you to experience it firsthand for yourself and go trim that junk of yours. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code ROTO at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. Again, get 20% off and free shipping with the code ROTO, R-O-T-O at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com with code ROTO. All right, Devin, this is the part of the show why the viewers tune in, cue the music. Let's talk about the helicopter plays. Uh, Ian's article is already up on PFF. You can read that every week along with his mismatch manifesto. But let's talk about some low owned plays that can win some tournaments. We've mentioned them here and there. Let's hear what you got for me. Yeah, that's the goal, man. The criteria I use has got to be Sunday main slate only. They can't have a top five price tag at the position. You know, don't be predicting Devontae Adams to go off and have a big game. And they also can't have uh, ideally not projected ownership above 5%. I know we might have been using you know, different sources for that. So we, we can be a little loose on that one. But yeah, in general, just high upside, low owned plays. Those are the helicopter picks. And I've released my five finalists, talked about some of these guys already. And you've talked about other ones, man. But I got Stefan Diggs and DJ Chark at wide receiver. We haven't talked about Chark a ton, but I just think it's a little scary in this matchup. Maybe the Jaguars just completely face plan and can't do anything. But even if that happens, that means they're going to be passing the entire game. Chark's the undisputed wide receiver one in this offense. I really think Minshew and Chark could look a lot like 2019 Ryan Fitzpatrick, Devontae Parker, you know, YOLO, DGAF, ballers that are on a bad team that could still put up a bunch of fantasy points. Uh, and that running back, Todd Gurley, for all the points you said. I was kind of off him earlier in the week, but I uh, had a PFF zone. Kevin Cole on a, on the podcast on a Thursday PFF Fantasy Football podcast brought up a lot of the same points uh, you made about that general just positive uh, possibility for a great game script find the end zone a bunch of times and also Ken and Drake for the reasons I said earlier. And for the quarterbacks, uh, you know, I do think Cam Newton is someone that should be in a bunch of GPP lineups. You know, it's a little tricky knowing the, who to stack them with, but don't be afraid to even go naked with Cam. He has that uh, rushing upside. And, you know, even if uh, you can't quite get more than a James White or Julian Edelman in there, I think Cam is good enough to do it on his own. So Diggs, Gurley, Chart, Cam, Drake, those are my top five. One of those dudes I'll be dropping down to Chopper uh, Saturday midnight uh, with their name next to it. All right. I got to try to compete with you. Right. So I'm not, I don't have emojis. I don't even know how you do that. You probably just copy paste something to get that helicopter. You're not banging all those buttons to make that right. You get, you got some system worked out for that. But, hey, uh, uh, I'm a magician never reveals the uh, trick. <laughs> uh, so a couple guys I'm looking at, I mentioned, I liked uh, Mitchell Trubisky. We've got Allen Robinson. I'm going deeper. I'm going Anthony Miller, 2% ownership. Let's go Trubisky. Uh, Miller always battling shoulder injuries throughout his career. Uh, again, he ran into the buzzsaw, Kansas City, Minnesota to close out last season. I think he got injured week 17 anyway. But before that, uh, a little four-week stretch, twenty, basically 30 DraftKings points, 13, 26, and 13. One of the reasons why Mitchell Trubisky had that little run I talked about at the top show, Anthony Miller was healthy. He actually had uh, a viable target to throw the ball to. Miller toasted Detroit last year. Uh, nine receptions, 13 targets, 140 yards for 26 fantasy points. And then earlier in the season, it didn't really work out, but I think he was working his way from injury. Uh, he's got the same wide receiver cornerback matchup uh, going this year as he did last year. I'm looking for Anthony Miller as a nice cheap option. He's 5,000, not the cheapest, right? And there's some really good plays just above him, but low ownership, high upside paired with Trubisky, run it back with someone in the Detroit game. I think you got yourself a good stack there. And the other one is I already mentioned Darren Waller. I like the Raiders pass targets. You get leverage off Josh Jacobs as much as you like Josh Jacobs. I think if that game gets away from them a little bit, maybe he gets scripted out. You get the passing game. You get Henry Ruggs. He's re reasonably cheap. Brian Edwards, uh, I think the dude's minimum price on FanDuel, and he's uh, I don't think he's much more expensive on DraftKings. You can get them in there. Uh, it's leverage off the run game. If you're not just specifically stacking that game, right? Like who really wants to use Derek Carr as a freaking quarterback? Not me, <laughs> but you can. I think Carr's got a little bit of upside here. 
uh, I think you can use right secondary stacks. I talk about that in my Millionaire Maker article. It's you have a, another game right with your quarterback wide receiver. The most powerful secondary stack is the running back slash opposite wide receiver stack. Hello, we got Christian McCaffrey. You can pair him with one of Henry Ruggs or Brian Edwards or Darren nice. Waller. Get yourself to the top of the Millionaire Maker. Those are a couple of my plays again. I, uh, I really like the rugs call. And honestly, I, he was probably like number six on my list. If I couldn't uh, get there, I think people are just too worried about this. I, you know, it's true. Derek Carr doesn't consistently throw down field much, but a couple big games though. Yeah, but he can get big names and, and rugs can, you know, he can take those screens and short passes and, you know, he can use his four, two speed to take those at distance. He doesn't necessarily need, you know, 50 air yards per target to make that happen. So I, I like those calls. All right, Ian, it's been fun. Go check out his Mitch Ma Mismatch Manifesto on PFF. You don't even need a subscription to read that. You can also get his helicopter plays. Uh, he's got that out today. If you want to see the final one, uh, follow him on Twitter at Ian Hardit or I Harditz. Uh, that's I H A R T I T Z. And you'll be able to follow him and get his helicopter play. Uh, any final, final words, Ian? Uh, welcome, welcome to the Roto Grinders Club. I think the show went great. Yeah, man. Good to get the first one under our belt and just uh, best of luck to everyone out there. It's going to make some money this weekend. All right. Uh, for Ian, I'm Brent. Thanks to all you for watching and we out ya.